Hello, and today we're going to be looking at constructive manslaughter in the realm of criminal law. So let's begin by putting this offence in perspective. So we're dealing with a situation where somebody has caused someone else to die, i.e. a situation of homicide, murder, manslaughter. Then we're dealing with a situation where the accused, he lacked malice or forethought. What is malice or forethought? Well, it's a mens rea for murder, and it's essentially interpreted by the courts to mean intention to kill or cause grievous bodily harm. So where that's lacking, we're looking at involuntary manslaughter, which is here. And do note there are two types of manslaughter, voluntary and involuntary. Right, so we're dealing with involuntary manslaughter. Now, there's three types of involuntary manslaughter, basically where you killed someone without having the mens rea of murder. You have constructive um, manslaughter, which is what we're looking at today, then gross negligence manslaughter, then subjective recklessness. And I've done a dashed arrow because in the video we'll discuss that there is some conversation to what extent this third type of um, uh, involuntary manslaughter exists. So... Let us begin with constructive manslaughter. What we're essentially looking at here is where the courts will find um, a conviction of uh, manslaughter out of, they will construct this um, conviction out of a less serious criminal offence, for example, assault or um, theft. So, for example, I punch you, but as a result, say you die, we're looking at that situation where you could be um, liable for involuntary manslaughter, um, even though you're lacking malice or forethought. Now, there are four requirements um, when we're trying to establish these, and these were set out in the Attorney General's reference number three of 1994, 1997. And what are these four requirements? I'm not sure it's actually clear on the whiteboard, but I've written it out here, and this just says Attorney General, the case name. So those are the act must be intention, uh, intentionally committed, the act must be unlawful, the act must be dangerous, and the uh, act must have caused the death. Those are the four elements. Well, the first one, which is the act must be done intentionally, well, this is pretty straightforward. We're looking at direct intention, where it's aim or purpose, or oblique intention, where um, was death a virtual certainty, and did the defendant realize that death would be a virtual certainty, so oblique intention? That is pretty clear cut. Moving on swiftly, the issues arise in whether the act was unlawful and whether the act was dangerous. Because remember, it has to be both of these things. Now, the central um, key issue where you're looking at whether the act was unlawful is you're trying to construct this conviction out of another criminal act. So, for example, in R and Franklin, where um, the accused threw a box into the sea and he caused a swimmer to drown. Now, this could, could not be um, a criminal act because what he had done was trespass, which is um, obviously um, not legal in, in the realm of tort, but in terms of um, criminal offence, it was fine to be a trespasser. And so the Court of Appeal um, had to quash the sentence, basically, is what happened. So there is an example. Um, I also have um, another quote from Sachs LJ, who said in, in Lam in 1967, he said, the act must be unlawful in the criminal sense of the word, so it has to be a crime. Um, the other thing to note is it has to be a crime and it has to be more than negligence because we're trying to differentiate constructive manslaughter from gross negligence um, manslaughter. Now, some commentators do say that this type of manslaughter is limited to acts and so does not include omissions. And there is some evidence to support this, for example, in R and Lowe, 1973. However, in principle, there's no reason why we can't extend this to omissions. So do look out for that. Right, so we've established that the accused had an intention. Then we've also established that the act was um, unlawful, i.e. it was criminal. The next thing we need to look at is whether it was also um, dangerous. And here we're looking at a further three things. It has to be objectively dangerous, it has to cause harm, and it has to cause harm to someone. So we're going to look at these three areas in a bit more detail now. So what do we mean um, by uh, objectively dangerous? Well, in R and Church, 1966, 
um, it was said that it has to be such as all sober and reasonable pe uh, people would inevitably recognize uh, must subject the other person to at least the risk of some harm resulting therefrom. That might not make any sense because I've said it at the speed of light, but read it. It's quoted everywhere, but essentially the point is, is to the sober and reasonable person has to have realized that some harm, that this act was dangerous. Um, so when we're looking at this objectivity, what exactly are we looking at? Well, originally it was understood to be reasonable, um, uh, the dangerousness was understood to be reasonable from the perspective of a reasonable bystander, and that was in Arundel, 1989. However, this changed later on in the case of Watson, uh, 89, where essentially the court ruled that the act became dangerous as soon as a reasonable person in the defendant's shoes realized it was dangerous. And this allowed the court to take into account any um, specialist knowledge that the accused may have, for example, the person is frail, has a heart condition, etc. Then the next thing is, so we've understood what we mean by objectively dangerous, and so we have to look at what harm are we talking about. So originally in Dawson, Nolan and Wormsey in 1985, it was understood that harm refers to physical injury, not just um, terror. But then we have to understand, then came the ruling in Ireland and Burstow, where basically the House of Lords ruled that um, harm includes psychological illness when looking at actual bodily harm. So this also means, um, sends, image, uh, sends a, a signal to us that perhaps harm for the purposes of um, manslaughter should also include psychological illnesses as it is attributed to actual bodily harm too. And um, following this, so looking more recently, in the case of Carrie 2006, the Court of Appeal suggested that the ri risk of shock would render as, as something being dangerous, so it doesn't just have to be physical injury, but not the risk of emotional upset. And I think this judgment goes a bit to explain why in Johnstone, where the accused was spitting and throwing insults was not deemed a dangerous act because perhaps it made the defendant emotionally upset but it wasn't a shock or a terror perhaps that we also saw an island and um, a burst of when they established psychological illness was central to um, actual bodily harm too so and finally the key thing here is who is this um, objectively dangerous harm, which we think also includes psychological illness, who is this directed to? Originally, um, I think the case of Dalby, where they said that the harm has to be directed to the uh, victim, this changed in um, the Attorney General's reference number 3 of 1994, which is the same case that set out these four um, requirements, because they said it just has to be... Um, dangerous to someone not particularly um, the victim and I think in that case it was like the danger was to the mother but the person or the harm the death that occurred was of her unborn baby but that could still be you know it still satisfies the element of was the act the criminal act that took place dangerous yes it was even though it was directed at the child the um, um, criminal act was directed at the mother of the child and um, so finally, you need to question whether the unlawful and dangerous acts, which was intentionally committed, that we have looked at in the first three requirements, was it that caused death? Now, the normal rules of causation apply here. I have a seven-part series. I know it's a bit long, I'm sorry. But basically, the idea of the seven-part series is if you're looking at third-party intervention or medical intervention, you just click on that video because there's seven types of interventions. So... The normal straightforward questions of causation apply and you can look at my videos on causation if you're not sure, but that's constructive manslaughter. Thank you for watching.